days after the citizenship amendment act finally came into implementation india today has an exclusive conversation with senior advocate and king's counsel in london mr hari sagar thank you sir so much for speaking to us your first thoughts four years after it was first introduced the ca has finally come into effect and it's being met with a lot of opposition from activists from opposition parties what are your thoughts i have um, i've said this before and i'm saying it again uh i have uh, not understood where this opposition stands from i i saw a speech by the home minister i didn't know this fact that right from the beginning in fact even congress party had said that all those refugees who have come from a neighboring country that time there was a bangladesh because pakistan later in from afghanistan we should house them because if hindus christians jains sikhs who were a large part of the population of pakistan have uh, post its uh, becoming a theocratic state felt a sense of alienation and if they want to come to india it's, it's logical that india gives them citizenship and that's what we have done so the suggestion that if you have to give citizenship to one class of oppressed people you must extend this to the whole wide world to me makes no sense ultimately whom we want to give these are people of indian ethnicity and they are being discriminated intra in, in an inter religion context not intra religion even even within every religion we hear complaints about everybody not being treated equally but that's a matter for that religion to have but between religions when there is a theocratic state there is a qualitative difference in a theocratic state if you don't belong to the religion of that state a lot of states treat you in a manner which some people consider discriminatory and if you want to migrate the ethnicity is india there was no pakistan to 1947 we are all the same stuff if you want to give them citizenship i simply cannot fathom any but reason the- but the biggest criticism against the ca is that it is violative of article 14 and article 14 grants every person not just every citizen but every person equal protection under the law so when you every discriminate on the basis yeah. right in india but i have an equal right to contest for american election i'd love to try and fight against it the american constitution also guarantees equal protection of all equal protection to all americans not necessarily american citizens but to all americans our constitution guarantees equal protection of indian laws to all indians can an english person come and say why are you giving visas to the french why not to me how am i how am i different can the chinese today complain saying it's not fair people from thailand are given visas people from other asian countries are given visas why not us but surely this argument no but surely the answer can't be as simple as that because since it's, the time it is as simple as that it is quite as simple as that you want to go and say india should as a policy open its doors to people who are victimized outside india well, that's a policy choice right in the country in which i live now united kingdom they opened their doors and now they, they have a problem with asylum seekers and the in the immigration system is about to collapse if it is some people said it's already collapsed so those are policy choices those are not constitutional arguments let's be very clear right but when your country as a basic it's part of the basic structure that the country is secular so when in a secular country you're discriminating against somebody solely on the basis of what religion they come from no you're not tell me which indian is affected by this i'm not talking of indian citizen can you say there is a discrimination against chinese solely on basis of their ethnicity or their place there is equal bar <laughs> what are, we are talking constitutional law correct and it might not we are not talking policy yes you want to be a liberal heart go right ahead if the country has the resources get all the troubled people of the world and house them in india we don't have enough problems of our own right we are a very rich country with everybody living way above the uh, affluent line get everybody in but i don't understand this constitutional argument 
No, the constitutional argument is there because essentially through the CAA, you're aiming to... What is the meaning the of secularism? Will you explain to me since you people know so much constitutional law? That every religion needs to be treated equally at par with one another and nobody should be discriminated. You, you're mistaken about secularism. Yeah. Religions are treated differently. When the government suggests uniform civil court, you go up in arms and say you can't treat everybody similarly. Secularism is freedom of thought freedom of religion and the right to practice and profess your religion without any discrimination. Which Indian is being denied that? And I'm not saying citizen. Who living in India is being denied that? No, but okay, for example, if there are minorities within the Muslim religion in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Afghanistan, who are being persecuted against? Those minorities do not have the same options compared are to... We, uh, are we micromanaging Islam in Pakistan or are we giving uh, uh, refugee status and citizenship to the non-Muslims in a Muslims declared theocratic state? Right, but even so if we this, talk about... You, are, are we micromanaging is, how Islam is run in Pakistan? Who gives you the right to do so? Hmm. Should, not Pakistan, should not the people who administer a theocratic state of Islam sort out their own problems. But or are, we, are we going to be big brother and say, no, no, you know, I, you know what? I don't like the way you treat one subsect of Islam. So I am going to invite them to come to India. A very strange argument. But it's not just about Muslims either. Like we are uh, not allowing Jews to enter India if there are any Jews that are persecuted. How many India. are there? Are there any? Irrespective. Are there any? Irrespective. Sure arguments are never on theory. Even if it's a small population, what about How people many? who are atheists? What Three, about people who are atheists? Two and a half. How many ever? Even if it's a no, small population? No, no, population. no, no. I'm sorry. Here again, you get your constitutional law wrong. Hmm. We are also not allowing Mongolians to come into India, right? From Afghanistan. How many are there? We don't know. Maybe none. And there may be a man from the moon living in, in uh, this, whom we don't know about. We should allow him also. How many? We don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. That's not how okay. constitutional challenges are brought. You have to say here as a body of people okay. who is similarly situated. First of all, whether it applies to allowing people in hmm. for a constitutional law, I don't accept. But if you say there is a body of people similarly situated, whom you are not allowing in which body? Jews, bad example. Okay, so even if we talk about, say, for example, uh, the idea behind CA is to help a humanitarian aid. No. Persecuted no, no. Again, what you got it? it wrong. That's what I'm saying. Please be clear on the gap between the policy and the constitutionality. You should say India should be broad minded. Since we are such a rich and prosperous country with no problems of our own, we should open our borders to any and everybody who's troubled in the world. That's a point of view. Some people say, no, we, we have enough of our own. Let's worry about our own. These are people who are of our own ethnicity. And the policy is that people of Indian, pre-47 Indian origin, who are now in two parts of what used to be Indian, which have now turned theocratic hmm. and are therefore being subjected to inferior rights by definition, but they are not secular countries. Afghanistan is now no longer secular, Pakistan is not secular. They want to come to a secular country, the Hindus want to come back to a secular India, the Sikhs want to come back to a secular India. They are a class apart and classification is always permitted. Should you have such a classification is a policy argument. If you do have a policy like this, is that classification valid is a constitutional argument. And I see on its face, yes, it is. But what's the logic of including Afghanistan in this list? Because Pakistan and Bangladesh, like you said, were countries that have... You know the population of, uh, in Afghanistan? There were... There are three or four basic tribes which constitute Afghanistan. And now I speak with some authority. I'm an Afghan right? Hmm. It is the local, the Pashtus, the people from Pars, the Parsis, the sizable Zoroastrian committee, 
community. And they have to practice their religion today in secrecy. They have almost all left. Then you have a very sizable Sikh community. And you have a sizable Buddhist community, some of the finest Buddhist art, which the Taliban has destroyed, the Gandhara art. The Buddhist libraries were amazing. So these are known, recognized communities which constituted. Afghanistan was not a country, Afghanistan was a region. And right from Balkh down to here, it, it, was a, it was a geographical region where people lived happily. My wife is, is Muslim, but she says, well, what was she taught when she was growing up? It is first family, community, country, and then religion. Love equally. This is the order of priority. Those priorities have changed. Today, you have the Taliban. You have, I mean, she, come, she came from a country where they used to have parties, they used to have drinks, they used to wear Western clothes, and she went to a French-speaking school. Can you think of that in Afghanistan? No, you can't. So Afghanistan has changed dramatically. Now, people who were used to the Indian Sikhs, do, do they have a right to freely set up Gurdwaras there? No, Gurdwaras have been demolished. Buddhist places of worship have been demolished. So how do you compare all these? I've not heard of any synagogues being demolished in Afghanistan. There is also an argument about an arbitrary cutoff date of 31st December 2014. Why has that been set as the cutoff date? Question number one. And does that not... Have to have some cutoff date, right? But what is the reason? If the idea uh, is to help... Who is affected by that? Suppose you made it 2013, would it help? No, if the idea is to help minorities from other countries come and seek uh, refuge in India, then why have a cutoff date at all? Why not? The law was brought on 31st December 2014. You say all the, a large number of these people are already in India. Mm. They're living here. This mm. is not open the doors for endless. Mind. Again, it's a policy choice. It's a policy choice. What the government is saying is a very large, we are, we are not inviting migration. These are people who have migrated and have not getting the benefit of Indian citizenship. But the second part of my question then is that isn't that then contradictory with what Section 6A of the Citizenship Act, which is also under challenge before the Supreme Court says, because there's a specific timeline under 6A, which is from, I think, 1969 to 71. And then you have a timeline under the CAA, which is still 2014. So essentially, a Muslim... Both are parliamentary legislation, right? Correct. But a Muslim... How does it become unconstitutional? The later law will prevail. No, it's, it, isn't it contradictory? Because a Muslim who's entered India, say, in 1971, can enter Assam, but at the same time, he cannot enter... The Assam law has been struck down. Hmm. The Assam law was the most ridiculous law. I know because when I was Solicitor General, I supported the challenge to that law, and finally, a judgment was given by Supreme Court. It was absurd. If you entered the Bangladesh border, you talk of discrimination, let me tell you what discrimination was. If you were a Muslim who crossed Assam, you were not to be removed. If you crossed two kilometers below that, into Bengal, you were to be removed. That made sense, because it was by a secular government, right? Come on. Just one last question before I let you go. You... I think spend more time in London than you do in India. You travel the world. What does a law like this do for India's global image, which is increasingly, at least in the global media, Believe becoming... Me, nobody cares here. Nobody cares here. People see it as, okay, India is, is, is recognizing de jure, what is a de facto. I mean, a lot of these people have already come into India. It's recognizing... It's maybe some leading newspaper who finds everything wrong about India. And believe me, there is a lot of jealousy about India today in this one world. They are losing their status. <clears throat> I live in London. I love this city. Make no mistake. But it is in shambles. The infrastructure is in shambles. When I land at Delhi Airport, I feel today I've come from a developing country into a developed country. That's the difference. That's the big thing to say. I'm telling you, that's the difference. Delhi airport, you have 14 people who are doing your immigration. In London, you can land in Heathrow with 200 passengers and two agents because they don't have money for others. 
It is the only airport in the world which for first class and club class passengers, they cannot even afford class check. This is where you are. The train service on which this whole country depends has become so dodgy, so dodgy. Half the time your trains are running late. The traffic, <clears throat> one day I come from home to work, if I drive by car, it takes 18 minutes, next day can take 50 minutes because two roads have closed. Because something has been dug up because some water pipe has burst or gas pipe has burst. You, you want to see the NHS the health service, we complain about Indian health service, you have to see what the health service here is doing. Non-essential operation, that means if you have a heart problem, you become not urgent. You could get a date nine months from now, six months from now. So, you know, it's and, and doctors going on strike, nurses going on strike, you must be reading about this, train drivers going on strike. And it spread all over the world, Lufthansa, Germany, Lufthansa was on strike. So there is a lot of jealousy about the changing global power play. People realize today India has become the fifth largest economy, bigger than UK, bigger than that. It will become the third largest economy in another four or five years if we continue at our rate of growth. So there is a lot of jealousy. So people write all kinds of things as though they are the earth shaking things which are going on in India. Nobody writes about what Indian roads have become. I am telling you, I was taken by surprise when somebody said Delhi to Dehradun is a four and a half hour drive. I said, you must be joking, it's nine hours. They said, no, have you seen the new motorways? Come to the English motorways, I'll tell you what state of disrepair they are. So, you know, please, India is seen with great respect by people who do not have any slants. And for people who have slants, we don't care. This matter has been pending in the Supreme Court for a really long time now, uh, ever since it came into being. And just days, uh, hours barely after the rules were enforced by the government, urgent applications have been filed again before the Supreme Court for a hearing. Which I don't uh, understand. Now, hold on. By getting a stay, what are you going to get? Are you going to, is the Supreme Court going to say extend it to everybody? No. At least a handful of people who are getting it. Is there a quota? There is no quota. Those who are getting it, let them get it. You are saying more people should be given, right? You're not saying nobody should be given. So why do you want to stay? Right. So how do you see this proceeding in the Supreme Court now? Do you think it's going to be taken up urgently? Because I think what the last... The urgency I... about, that's what I'm saying. What is the urgency about this? Is there a queue at our borders that people are, are dying on the border to come in and, and the borders will have to be opened? There's a cutoff date of 2014, for God's sake. So people who have already come in have come in. Are they, is anybody being evicted? Is anybody being thrown out? You can come and say, okay, don't evict so and so. But you can't, to say stay this, means those who are going to get citizenship don't get it. If that's what they want to achieve, good. Well, so, like, uh, Hari Salve there, proving again why he's one of India's top lawyers, defending CA as strongly as possible. Thank you so much. You don't need a top lawyer. <laughs> Thank you so much sir, for speaking to India today. Take care.